Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today for our Lunch and Learn, Holding Utilities Accountable. The way we generate and use electricity is changing fast, but the way utilities are regulated and paid has hardly changed in 100 years. The current mismatch between utility incentives and consumer needs is standing in the way of our progress towards urgent clean energy goals. Fortunately, advocates in Maine and across the country are working to rewrite the way electric utilities do business. State Senator Stacy Brenner is with us today to discuss LD 1959, the bill she's sponsored to establish performance standards for Maine's utilities. And Maine's public advocate Bill Harwood is also with us today to share his perspective perspective on LD 1959, uh, considering that the Office of the Public Advocate's primary responsibility is to represent the interests of main utility customers. We are particularly happy to have you with us and welcome to both of you. I know you have been working around the clock on this bill, so thanks for taking this hour to, to explain it all to us. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today. We will hear from our speakers and then tackle your questions in the Q&A at the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send those questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you and I'll keep track of them and ask them at the end. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can message Will Sedlak and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous lunch and learns. Thank you again for joining us and Senator Brenner, I will turn it over to you to kick things off. Thank you so much, Kathleen, and thank you um, to Maine Conservation Voters for inviting me to join the lunch and learn. We are uh, today actually uh, in work session on this bill and taking a little break. So um, the timing is perfect. And uh, I really am grateful to um, our new public advocate, Bill Harwood, and for uh, also showing up today uh, to speak about this. And I've had a really great time working with him on this piece of legislation. And I'm just so excited that he's in the role uh, that he's in. I think it's really great for the people of Maine. Um, so. The genesis of the, this bill uh, comes from uh, really wanting to do more work on utility accountability. Um, and the initial bill had a little bit of um, a long public hearing and there was lots of feedback. So the amendment that we put forward, I feel like incorporates a lot of the feedback that came forward during the public hearing. So the amendment and the bill in general essentially holds utilities accountable for their performance with strengthened language. Uh, with required penalties if they fail to meet standards for reliability, service, rates, and meeting, most importantly, means climate goals. It decouples the accountability system from the debate about whether we should lift, whether we should shift from an investor-owned utility to a publicly owned utility. And that debate really should happen in connection with the proposed referendum that's being worked on now and a question that Maine voters should decide on at the ballot box. This bill is really about creating a report card system with consequences that will apply to any form of utility ownership, regardless of whether it's an IOU or a COU. And the other big thing about the amendment for this bill in what I think is one of the most exciting parts is it requires um, that we do integrated holistic grid planning to help create the electrical grid of the future that we need in the most cost-effective way possible. The amendment includes an entirely new section about grid planning, which has been called, oh, called for over and over. And, in, and this time we feel like it's, it's the right time to get it started. 
uh, when it will look at load forecasts, distributed generation, electrification of heating and transportation, and how all of this fits together in a dynamic modernized grid that serves all of Maine's people. Um, so I'm gonna let uh, our advocate Harwood walk us through um, some of the specifics. And so I'll pass it on over to him. And I look forward to questions. Thank you, Senator Brenner. Thank you to Maine Conservation Alliance for inviting me today. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this is an important piece of legislation that uh, we're all working hard on to uh, shape. Uh, literally, as we speak, there are legislators on the Energy and Utilities Committee working on this bill, um, and I'm proud to uh, support Senator Brenner's bill. Um, before I get into the uh, details of it, some of you may not be as familiar with the Office of Public Advocate. And Kathleen, if you can just bring up the next slide. Um, what do we do at the Office of Public Advocate? We are, have been around state government for 41 years. Today, there are nine of us who work there. And our job simply is to represent the ratepayers uh, in any advocacy where it's either the legislative or regulatory bodies. We do most of our work in front of the main PUC, but we are also actively involved in the main legislature, primarily in the Energy and Utilities Committee. It is a, it, it is a wonderful group of really hardworking people who are every day trying to find ways to make sure that the ratepayers uh, get good service at affordable rates. So let's go right into 1959, if we can. Uh, the next slide. It's worth, first of all, acknowledging Governor Mills and Senator Brenner for bringing this thing, this bill forward. It is a governor's bill, and I know the governor has worked hard on it and is very invested in it. This is something that when I came to state government in the fall, it was clear it was time to do something more holistic and more uh, comprehensive about how we hold our utilities accountable. So there are a number of sections in this bill. In some ways, they are loosely connected, some even more loosely than others. But I think the way I would encourage all of you to think about this is, as you look at the entire package, there is no doubt that if enacted, this bill will assure that ratepayers get good service at affordable rates. And that's really the goal here. Each piece has a part to play in it, and I'll highlight those, but don't lose sight of the fact that uh, the package is really what's before the legislature. So moving on to the first uh, question that we sometimes have gotten is, isn't a lot of LD 1959 already in law? And before I get into the substance, I'll just address that right up front. No, a lot of, some of it is new, but even those portions of it, which technically or theoretically, the Public Utilities Commission could have done on its own, this provides a very clear and direct legislative guidance to them, a legislative directive for them to take action. And that shouldn't be minimized. That is an important piece of this bill. There are, several new features. Uh, one is the uh, enhanced administrative penalties we'll get to in a minute and enhanced protection for uh, utility whistleblowers. So there are several new features of, in the bill, uh, but there are also a strong directive. So the next slide would go to uh, the question of affordability. And I can tell you that we hear loud and clear that Maine electricity customers have really frustrated, they've had it with high electricity prices. The 80 plus percent increase in the standard offer rate that took effect by January 1st, has we have had a flood of calls to our office. We, there have been a flood of calls to the PUC, to the media, to the legislature. Everyone's phone is ringing off the hook uh, uh, with people who are really upset with this increase. I've said before, and I'll say it again here today, an 80 plus percent increase in standard offer service isn't acceptable. We got to do better. This bill will help us find ways to keep those electricity prices under control. There are three things that we point to. First is enhanced financial audits. 
we want the PUC and this bill directs the PUC to engage in detailed financial audits of CMP and Versant to make sure that their expenses are reasonable and that they are maintaining them, they're operating efficiently, and that will help make sure that they are, the statutory rates that come out of that process are just and reasonable. The second piece is a new piece that Senator Brenner has just put before the committee uh, in the last couple of days, which would be a benchmarking proposal. There, we would direct the PUC to go out and find half a dozen or more uh, utilities that are similarly situated to CMP and Versant. They tend to be serving uh, rural areas. They tend to be on a national scale, smaller utilities. And then once those are identified to do a very, hire a consultant to do a very careful, detailed comparison of expenditures. And if we find that CMP and Versant have expenditures that are out of line, above the average, above the mean, above the median, those would be flagged for further investigation and would be where uh, the party should devote some of their resources the next time a rate case is filed. It's something as basic as you know, business uh, have been doing for years, and that is benchmarking your organization against similarly situated organizations to make sure that somewhere inside the organization, you haven't got uh, expenditures, which for some one reason or another are out of line. And the last piece is enhanced whistleblower protection. Uh, we know from decades of, of government policy that whistleblowers coming forward who have seen and been part of an organization or an operation where they have seen uh, behavior, actions, waste, fraud, neglect, uh, uh, inefficiency, we want those people to come forward. There is a whistleblower protection statute on the books now, and I will tell you candidly, it is an embarrassment. It does not give whistleblowers anywhere near the protection that most of us would assume. So thankfully, this bill will make it clear. It has a number of features. We're not just talking about employees of the utilities, but employees of their affiliates and their contractors, the people who provide some goods and services by contract these people all have an opportunity to see inside the, the operations of the utilities, and we want them to be comfortable coming forward to the legislature, to the PUC, and to the public advocate to share whatever concerns they have so that we can then evaluate those concerns and take appropriate action. So those are the three things that are getting at the affordability question to make sure the rates are reasonable. And turning the next slide, the other piece of utility is service. We sometimes get uh, focused almost exclusively on rates and price, but it is just as important that the utilities provide good service. We've seen mistakes in billing, We've seen frustration of our solar renewable by utilities not being able to manage and produce the kind of service we want. So for the first time, we are directing the PUC to come up with what we call a quarterly report card program in which four times a year, they will issue a report card on a number of standards that are well-established within the industry and those standards will conclude the minimum requirement for the utility. And if those utility, if any utility fails those standards and gets a failing report card, they will know that they are facing consequences. If they have a failing report card for two consecutive quarters, there will be uh, penalties. The PUC will be required to assess the need for penalties for those uh, failure. And ultimately, if the penalties do not get the attention of the utility, there is a provision for a mandatory sale or divestiture of the utility for persistent and egregious failure to meet the standards. So this is getting tough. These standards, we don't have a choice. We only have one utility per service territory. We can't go shopping to uh, uh, down the street or 
to the other side of the mall to see if we can get better service, better goods uh, at better prices. We are captive to them and they must uh, provide us with good service. Turning to one of the more Im most important issues of the day, uh, the next slide would be the climate change. And we are hearing over and over again, the important role that our electric utilities are, must play in order for us to achieve the goals that the legislature and the uh, government have set for us. And in order to achieve those goals, we really need uh, the PUC uh, and the electric utilities and the OPA all working on toward that effort. And we are prepared to do that. This bill has a very comprehensive and robust reporting and planning process under the direction of the PUC that will invite all of the interested parties Every three years, the utilities will come forward with a 10-year plan. That 10-year plan will get heavily reviewed, edited, considered. At the end of it, the PUC will be in a position to direct the utilities to take necessary steps. Some of this may be as uh, straightforward as protecting their assets and operations, making sure that their substations are not in a, uh, prone to, in an area which is prone to flooding from major storms, and making sure that the lights stay on whenever we have a climate change driven uh, uh, climate event, weather event. And also to make sure that as we go forward with electrification, heat pumps, electric vehicles, that the, legit, that the utilities are doing their part to be ready for that and to continue to provide good service to those customers who in, use those enhanced electrification to uh, help us meet our climate change goals. And finally, uh, as Senator Brenner said, the issue of public power has been lurking in the shadows here for some time and will continue. The original bill did ha have a sort of uh, backdoor way of addressing it to come up with a different way of getting to public power. That was not viewed favorably by most anyone, whether whichever side of that issue you're is on. So we have taken that out. Senator Brenner has taken that out of the bill. And I think what's really important is, regardless of what the main citizens do with that referendum process, regardless of whether the signatures are filed, regardless of what the vote might be down the road on public power, this bill will still provide ratepayer benefits. Either way, this bill will help benefit ratepayers. I could go on and get into the details, uh, but I think it would be much more interesting to the audience and certainly to me to hear your questions, your concerns about the bill. And as Senator Brenner said, it is still being shaped and will be shaped further this afternoon. So uh, whatever questions, concerns, ideas, comments you have, I'm anxious to hear them and we can pass them on to the committee uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to acknowledge that, that the committee was working this bill all morning and, and you're going back at it. So thank you so much. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation and a lot of discussion about utility accountability, which is a, a really good thing, uh, but, but also a little bit of confusion. So thank you both for clearing some of that confusion up. Uh, we hope that by the end of, uh, of our program today, everybody on the line will have a much clearer sense of, uh, of what we can do to hold utilities accountable through LD 1959, and that you will take the opportunity to uh, follow up with your state lawmakers and let them know that when this bill comes comes to the floor, uh, you would like them to vote in support. So you, as everybody, all our regulars know, you will get a follow-up email later this afternoon with a, a link to the recording and a link to an action alert that will make it really easy for you to send a message to your lawmakers, uh, letting them know that, that we deserve affordable, reliable electric service and uh, utilities that share our commitment to climate goals. 
All right, we have some great questions in the, the queue already. I invite anyone to, to send additional questions directly to me through the chat and, uh, and I'll, I'll juggle those and, and get them asked. So let's start off with um, a couple of definitions. When we talk about utility rates, we often hear the words reasonable and affordable. Are those the same thing or are there some differences we should be paying attention to? Senator Brenner, do you want me to take a, take a stab at that? Yeah, we use the word affordability as a shorthand way to uh, talk about utility rates and especially for our low income citizens where we know that for some low income citizens, rates are, are electric rates are a real problem. We never want to put our low income uh, citizens in the untenable position of having to choose between paying their utility bills and paying for needed food and medicine. So that is where we tend to focus affordability. The, legis the statutory standard by which the PUC sets rates has, has a phrase just and reasonable. And within that just and reasonable are dozens and dozens of principles and subcategories uh, with that the rate making process, the rate making formula. And if the rate making formula is applied and the PUC applies it, the end result at the end of a versant or CMP rate case are what the PUC deems to be just and reasonable rates. And that's why we sometimes hear the phrase reasonable or just and reasonable. And those are really designed to give the utilities the revenue they need or they, uh, the PUC finds that they need to continue to provide good service. Thank you, that really helps. And, and also gives us a little bit of a window into just how many factors are, are weighed in rate making. Uh, and they're not always clear to, to us regular people. So thank you very much. <laughs> we're, we're lucky to have you looking out for our interests. Uh, another question about the, the balance of, of your work, Advocate Harwood, with the work of the PUC and, and with the work of the legislature, Senator Brenner. Uh, how, what is the legislature's role in directing the Public Utilities Commission? Or is the Public Utilities Commission running the show? How, do, how does that all work? Well, the governor uh, nominates the members of the PUC, the legislature, the Senate specifically approves those nominations after hearings in the EUT committee specifically. Um, so there's a sort of a balanced vetting process that happens as a way to form that entity. Um, Advocate Harwood, do you wanna speak further to that? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's worth stepping back for a minute and, and sharing with your uh, listeners and viewers. About 100 years ago, and as we get into the New Deal, we came up in government with this new idea, and, every, and, and many of us have thought it was one of the best developments in government in which the legislature took a category of disputes and moved them into what we call administrative agencies. They took them out of the court system and move them in. And you guys are probably all very familiar with the, the DEP and the Workers' Comp Commission, and at the federal level, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the National Labor Relations Board. These are all what we call independent quasi-judicial regulatory agencies. And that's what the PUC is. The PUC is designed to take issues that might go end up in court and put them into a very uh, narrowly focused, specialized expertise area where they call the balls and strikes. Now, the Office of Public Advocate, you can think of as a mini tiny little attorney general's office with a very, very narrow, and that is we are designed, uh, uh, authorized to represent ratepayers. So we are the advocates. We go before the PUC representing the ratepayers. The utilities are there representing their interests. Oftentimes, many interveners are there, and the PUC at the end of the day calls the balls and strikes and tries to get it right. That might be the best 
explanation I have heard. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I have been much more likely to describe the PUC as a bit of a black box that, that we don't necessarily understand what's going on in there. Um, so thank you. That makes it much more clear and, and also maybe helps answer this, this next question, which is that we haven't necessarily seen the, the accountability from the PUC that we really are counting on. And so you mentioned at the, the top of the presentation, Advocate Harwood, that, that even the pieces that are in law already, there's value in the legislature sort of underlining those. Can, can you just say a little bit more about that in light yeah. of the, the explanation you just gave us? Yeah, this is this tension the PUC lives under. It, on the one hand, we want the, the public wants to know what the PUC is up to. They want to know what they're doing. They want accountability. And yet the PUC also has this sense, this, this uh, quasi-judicial sense where in the, even though they don't wear black robes and they don't have a jury, they have this sense that they should be uh, not appear to be overly influenced by public opinion or partisan opinion. And so they're trying to be very thoughtful and reserved. And sometimes it gives the impression that they are not listening to the people of Maine. And that's a delicate balance. Uh, and I can certainly understand why a lot of people are frustrated with the PUC. Part of my job is to connect the people of Maine with the PUC and represent them there. So part of that is on me and I need to do a better job. And I intend to do a better job of making sure that the people of Maine know what my office is up to every day and representing their, their interests. But it is a delicate. And then the legislature is really the, the one who directs both the Office of Public Advocate and the PUC. Ultimately, we can only do as much as the authority given to us. And so there's this delicate balance between whether the legislature should dot every I and cross every T or is whether they should give broad uh, general policy direction to the PUC and let them sort it out and dot the I's and cross the T's. And there's no one perfect uh, answer to that dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. Uh, speaking of, of, of sort of the, the work of the PUC, one of the elements of this bill, uh, and, and Senator Brenner, you, you said it's the one of the pieces you're most excited about is this, this integrated grid planning piece. Uh, does the PUC have the, the internal sort of staff capacity to do that? Or, or will we need to provide additional funding uh, to support that work? I know there's a piece about an uh, assessment that the PUC would do, is that right? That's correct. So the way the amendment's written currently, there would, uh, the PUC would need to report uh, back about their capacity um, and a needs assessment for completing grid planning uh, by the end of this calendar year. So that would help inform perhaps the next budget cycle to figure out um, whether or not, it, the way PUC gets funded is, is not from the general fund. So it's, there's some complications about uh, how that funding cycle would work. Um, it would most likely be rate payer dollars, but um, Advocate Harwood, you could probably speak yeah. to that also. Yeah, thank you, Senator. It, it is worth uh, your audience knowing that uh, the public advocate and the PUC are one of the very few organizations in state government that are not funded by income tax or sales tax. We are funded by a special assessment, we call it. It is in effect a tax that is added into <coughs> every utility bill that goes out from every regulated utility. And there's always a delicate balance between if we had more resources, we could do more ratepayer advocacy. If the PUC had more resources, they could do more planning and policy and oversight, getting that balance right between not having that utility assessment too high, but also making sure we have the resources is always tricky. And I think Senator Brenner's right. If we're gonna do this kind of robust climate change focused uh, planning, there probably will be one or two new positions uh, that will have to be funded by the uh, utility ratepayers. 
but that's not that's not built into this bill because we need the to give the PUC some time to figure out what they need, right? We don't want to just make assumptions. Yeah, okay. that's correct. That that makes sense. Uh, we also have a question about the the piece of the bill that addresses climate and our climate requirements. The utilities, can you say a little more about the role that the utilities play in meeting those climate requirements? Because I, I think there's some other entities that also have, have a role. So how do you tease out what they're responsible for, what, what other or entities are responsible for? Given that we're grading them on this, if this if this all comes to pass, <laughs> right? I'll try to take a stab at that one. So climate comes up uh, in a handful of spots in this bill. Um, it comes up in the first section around the report card uh, related to um, distributed energy and engaging with distributed energy. Uh, the second part it comes up is in the divestiture section. So it makes sure that uh, if there's a divestiture lever that gets pulled that any new entity that comes in as the owner would have the technical capacity to meet Maine's climate goals and the greenhouse gas emission goals for the state. Um, and then the sort of biggest place where it comes, well, there's, a, there's the requirement that the utility do some planning and um, present that to, to us uh, related to their ability to manage their asset as it relates to the effects of climate change on that asset. So how does a flood um, on the coast um, engage with poles and wires and what is that, what, what is their plan for that? It's sort of like the kind of thumbnail scenario for that piece. And then the last part that really is, I, I think like the keystone for helping Maine achieve its decarbonization goals is really in the holistic comprehensive grid planning. So that's the section where we really have the ability to understand as electrification of our state increases with regard to heat and transportation and our grid needs to grow. Are we really thinking about it in a holistic big picture way and making sure that the growth makes sense for where distributed energy and distributed storage needs to be, the, um, our non-wires alternative um, issues are being met. So it just takes the whole thing to the next level and some folks who've looked at that section who are uh, smarter than me with regard to energy policy have said that the way that we've framed it actually sets Maine up to be a real leader in New England with regard to moving forward with grid planning in, uh, in, in a really holistic and inventive way and hopefully put us um, in the driver's seat of being able to decarbonize and meet our goals. Really exciting to hear, uh, and and a good reminder that in many ways the grid that we have has just evolved over time without necessarily that sort of long term planning. Um, certainly not with all the information that we have now about what what the energy system of the future needs to look like. Uh, many of us are aware of. You know, we, we, we learn about the grid when we see news in the paper that says, you know, CMP is not integrating solar or net metering and, and community solar are, are really tough to figure out. What are the pieces uh, of this bill that would, how, how would the pieces of this bill help facilitate or encourage CMP to be more, um, more open and perhaps more obligated to to add solar onto the grid. You want me to go take a shot at that, Senator? Yeah. So there's two ways. One one is the quarterly report card will set standards for them. You know, we have to set standards that CMP and Verson have to be ready to hook up the small renewable uh, projects that come online as a result of the legislature's foresight and planning in terms of moving us away from fossil fuel toward renewable energy. So that at a minimum, and they will face uh, the hefty administrative penalties 
if they're not able to do that. But the more uh, important and perhaps forward-looking is the planning process that Senator Brenner, and I think it's really important. You know, I think the utilities get a lot of criticism, much of it deserved, but occasionally it's just they're not quite sure what the society and the legislature and the government expect of them. And so hopefully out of the planning process, there will be clarity in that planning process and there will be an implementation plan to imp for CMP and Versen to implement the directives that come out of that planning process. And at that point, the hope is that they will get the message and they will get the clarity they need and they will then go off and promptly and efficiently and reasonably implement those directives, whether they be more staffing, more resources, more uh, facilities, more equipment, where it, whatever it is that's needed to make that work. And if they don't, <laughs> then we're back to our quarterly report cards. All right, all right. And I think, the, just, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Kathleen. Uh, if they don't meet the standards, there's an administrative penalty that will be uh, will be placed on the utilities that will either be a million dollars or 10% of um, earnings. Okay, so that sounds significant. <laughs> this isn't a slap on the wrist. It, it is designed to get their attention. If the PUC no. needs to go that high to get their attention, we will end the I can assure you the Office of Public Advocate will be aggressively advocating for a penalty that is high enough to get their attention should we think it's warranted. Okay. Uh, thinking a little more about the integrated planning process, uh, some, some municipalities have really ambitious climate action plans based on electrification of buildings and transportation. Uh, are there, is there anything in the, the bill that would give local officials a, a seat at the table during that integrated planning process? Yes, the, the, the uh, service standards, the quarterly report card specifically is gonna measure CMP's responsiveness to municipal officials. That will be one way that we will keep track of it, but they will also have a seat at the planning process that it is supposed to be robust, it will have stakeholder meetings. I think you've alluded, uh, Kathleen, to in sort of a joking way about how hard it is for some folks to understand what goes on in the hearing room at the PUC. I've been doing this work for over 40 years, and I still find it technically challenging from time to time. I can't imagine how someone could walk into that room and follow what's going on. I think it's one thing, something that all of us who are in this process need to be aware of, need to understand, and need to do better to make sure that it is open. And I'm very pleased that uh, Senator Brenner's uh, committee has going to be reporting out legislation for what we call intervener funding. So folks like this organization and others who want a seat at the table, who don't have the resources to hire the lawyers and experts and consultants will have an opportunity to ask the PUC at the beginning of the case whether some funding can be made available so that their ability to advocate is better. And I'm very pleased to support that legislation and very hopeful that it will end up on the governor's desk. You've talked a little bit about some of the things that will be in that both required through the integrated planning process and then graded through those quarterly report cards. Does the bill spell out exactly what the, that report card will look like, or, or are there still some details to be worked out on that front? Well, we have yet to see the bill voted on in committee yet, so <laughs> there's... Anything could happen. Anything could happen between now and, and when it's, uh, you know, we're like, we're like in labor and the, it's going to be born by the end of the day, <laughs> but we're not there. <laughs> so I don't know if it has brown eyes or blue eyes or, you know, hair or if it's totally bald. I just don't know. <laughs> but fingers are crossed that it's going to come out of committee favorably with lots of support. And um, we're going to head to the full legislature with a bill we can all feel really proud of. 
And Kathleen, in its current form, it does direct the PUC to initiate what we call a rulemaking proceeding once the governor signs the bill. And mm -hmm. in that rulemaking proceeding, the PUC will flesh out some of the details I think you were alluding to. So this is a delicate balance where the legislature and the committee are trying to give enough direction to the PUC so they get it right without uh, tying their hands because the PUC has a staff of about 65 people who are working hard every day to get this stuff right. And we wanna make sure that they have the opportunity to fill in the details, dot the I's and cross the T's, albeit consistent with the policy uh, directive of the legislature. So that goes back to that balance between the legislative direction and the administrative um, implementation. Right. And, and so if it's a, a rulemaking process, that means, Advocate Harwood, you'll be there on behalf of, of ratepayers, but organizations or, or businesses or any number of, of people could intervene in that case and have a, a way to say, I think it should be X, Y, or Z. Is that right? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I will have Senator Brenner, not literally, but figuratively sitting on my shoulder, <laughs> reminding me what the legislature wanted to come out of that rulemaking when I participate and advocate in that process. And, and then- Oh, and go ahead. all of the, you, you know, all of the uh, environmental community uh, organizations would be there advocating as well, you know, for all sorts of things, but specifically for, you know, reaching Maine's climate goals. So it's a long process to get this bill out of committee, and then it's just the beginning of the process is <laughs> what you're saying. We've got our work cut out for us. Um, Senator Brenner, you mentioned that, that this could put us, us Maine, in a, a position of real leadership. But do we have examples to look at in terms of, you know, what are other states doing or what are other countries doing? Uh, we can't be the only ones trying to figure this out right now. Um, that's true. There are other examples across the country of performance-based metrics or report cards, if you will, put in place. Um, it it's, can be challenging because they're all a little different and um, you know, you're trying to compare report cards in states or jurisdictions that are regulated versus deregulated, which is whether or not the transmission and distribution and the generation are together or separate. So, um, so it's a little bit challenging. There is some um, some data that supports that they are effective as incentives to encourage the utilities um, into better behavior. Um, the, with regard to grid planning, um, there's definitely evidence across the country that grid planning is essential. There's some states that have been doing it longer than others. There's plenty of states that haven't started um, any sort of comprehensive grid planning at all. Um, but it is a very talked about um, endeavor in the energy policy um, sphere. So I think most people recognize that it's essential if we're going to move forward and really realize um, climate goals. And Maine has done some, some work already thinking about this, right? There was a, a stakeholder process, was it last year? The Murdy. Murdy. And Murdy is what, main utility regulatory reform and decarbonization initiative? Did I get that? Oh, I think Murdy. so, good for uh, you. It, it led to a number of, there were a number of consensus recommendations that came out of that process, right? Is How does this bill line up with those, those recommendations? A lot of what's in the Murdy report as far as recommendations have, we've tried to bake into this um, grid planning section. Um, so we feel pretty good that we've reached a compromise to move grid planning forward and get something started. Um, and whenever you're working with a large uh, group of folks, um, inevitably, you know, you're, you're pushing and pulling and trying to find the path forward that brings as many people along with you. So I don't expect this will be um, over the years, the last iteration of the way planning happens. I suspect that the legislature will revisit um, what's not working and, and work to amend it. 
um, going forward. So um, I think it will be to some degree a work in progress, um, the way that it's set up as we learn more. And are there other bills or other pathways to, to get that those MERDI recommendations, like to move those forward? Or is this the, the vehicle for this legislative session that would, would go as far as we, we can right now? Yeah, this is it. <laughs> this is sort Thank of, uh, this is our last day of uh, committee meetings and then we move into, you know, back into full session. And, you know, the work of the legislature this year is done. Uh, hopefully, we'll see. <laughs> might and We might extend it, but it's it's done on April 20th. So it's, you know, the freight train's moving and, and there's really no more uh, additional space for bills to be introduced this session. So if we want integrated grid planning to get going, this is this is the moment. I know, um, I know we talked a little bit, Advocate Harwood, you talked a little bit about the, the intersection of this bill with the, the movement for a consumer owned utility. And uh, Senator Brenner, your, your comment about timeline has me thinking about how those two things <laughs> line up. Um, I know there are there are folks, including some on some with us today, who say, "I've had it up to here with CMP, and I can fully support, fully understand that perspective," and say, "Let's throw them out and and start from scratch." If I'm, what do you say to to folks who are really? Uh, passionate about that consumer owned utility and say this is this is just a delay is that is that fair or what would you what's your response um i was a co-sponsor of the cou bill in the last session and i'm a, still remain a large uh supporter of the movement i think that this bill um especially with the amendment uh really decouples the 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 cou from the bill and um, really allows the ability for the referendum process to move forward. I think it would be um, short-sighted of us not to want to hold our utilities accountable in the interim as we move forward with the referendum process. I don't think that this bill um, undermines that effort in any way. I think it's still quite popular. It has a lot of popular uh, has 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 a big tide up underneath it, and um, it's exciting. And it, and in some ways, there is a space in this bill around the divestiture clause, which is is um, part of the PUC's already existing statute. That if the utilities are not meeting the report card requirements or the grid planning obligations laid out that a third party could petition the PUC to open up an adjudicatory process to consider what it would look like to initiate divestiture. And that could be a pathway for the COU. So the entity could be developed, it could be in place, they could be watching, waiting for that failure to happen, pull the lever, petition the PUC and move forward. So in a lot of ways, I see this effort with the accountability bill decoupled from the COU, and I think they can happen in tandem. And I don't think it takes any of the thunder away from the work of the our power movement. Yeah, I would just add, I would agree with that, Senator, that regardless of whether we continue with investor-owned utilities or switch to consumer-owned utilities, we're still going to need to hold them accountable. We're still going to have ratepayers are going to need to be assured that they're getting good service at reasonable rates. And so uh, this bill in its latest form has worked really hard not to slide into that space and not to take a position. Uh, so regardless of whether you're for or against public power, you should be for this bill because this bill is good for ratepayers, regardless of which direction the state decides to go on that very important question. That's really helpful just to hear that that affirmation that we we can do both we can hold them accountable and and still kick them to the curb if they're not doing their jobs <laughs> um we have a question about going back to the conversation about the administrative penalties that could be assessed uh if with failing on failing grades uh, we've all learned a lot about how those costs get moved around through through companies so would those where would that where would a where would a utility get that money 
to pay their fee. And spoiler, is it us? No, no that, that is a simple question. Though any fines, penalties that are imposed on utilities today go to the shareholder. That comes out of shareholder profits. And that is a well-established uh, principle. And uh, this, the Office of Public Advocate will vigorously defend that principle and pursue that principle. It makes absolutely no sense to have asked ratepayers to reimburse the utility if they get fined for poor service. That's a big relief, thank you. <laughs> uh, we've talked a lot about CMP and, and it is the state's largest utility, but, but it's not the state's only utility. Does this bill apply to, to Versant and to some of the smaller utilities as well? Yeah, do you want me to go first, Senator? It, it, you have to look at each section. Um, okay. Most of the sec, I think I think I can say all the sections apply to both CMP and Versant, and that's about 90 plus percent of the state is served by those two large utilities. Several of the sections apply to all uh, T and D, what we call transmission and distribution utilities or delivery utilities, whether they be the large investor owned or the smaller consumer owned. And then there are still provisions of the bill like the whistleblower that apply to all utilities, whether they be gas utilities, water utilities, uh, or telephone utilities. So each section has a uh, constituent of utilities that the drafters thought were the appropriate focus. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and for the grid planning, I imagine Versant would be responsible for that that piece of the work as well. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay. We have so we have had so many good questions, and I hope that we have covered most of them. I'm scrolling through the chat just to make sure that I haven't missed any big big categories. Is there anything that you want us to know? When we go when we go out in our social weekends and chat about utility accountability, what should we what should we be saying? What should we be thinking about? I'll, I'll jump in. I, I hope that you have gotten a little bit of this from me, and I hope we can continue this dialogue to know that there are some really good people in Augusta who are working really hard to figure out some very challenging problems. And Senator Brenner is right there at the top of that list. There are people who uh, unfortunately, most of the citizens don't see or hear from every day or every week or even at all, but they're working really hard. And some of these issues are not easy. We have got to get this balance between uh, cost and the climate change. And it's not an easy answer to how quickly and how much we need to uh, end our dependence on fossil fuel and move towards solar and wind. We've got a lot of issues coming up with the uh, northern Maine renewables. We've got offshore wind renewables, and we are working really hard to try and figure out how to integrate those without having the electric prices, the electric rates go through the roof. And I just want to assure you that even though it may not always seem like that, there's a lot of hardworking people in the legislature and in the uh, agencies of government who are really working hard to get this right. Um, and I'll just add that I think that the, the bill in its entirety with the amendment in particular sets up a paradigm where affordability is baked in as a way of, uh, like, as we consider um, the bill as a, as a vehicle for rate stabilization. So I think that the, you know, achieving our climate goals, stabilizing rates for customers, and really setting up a framework to make sure that we're able to reach these climate goals is so crucial. I mean, we wanna be heading in the direction where oil and natural gas are not things that meters need to depend on in order to drive heat their homes, do the work that they need to do, industrial processes for me, for farming. Um, so, you know, the sooner we can head in that direction, 
the better off we're all going to be in terms of price volatility. And I, I just can't say enough that it's like laying track for the long game here. And this is just one small piece of it, but every little bit is important in the bigger picture. And we're dealing with the, you know, we have to deal with the system that we're handed. The PUC is in place, the public advocates in place, the legislature, the executive branch, the governor's energy office. So this is what we're working with. And so you're just always trying to figure out like, what door can you open and you know what lever can you pull? And I, I think this bill strikes a balance of um, moving something forward in this session that can help us achieve our collective goals. Thank you both so much for your, your leadership on this bill. Uh, I, I know you really have been working around the clock on this and we are so grateful. Uh, thank you for taking the time today to walk us through it. I, I've spent a lot of time this week looking at this, this bill and, and I understand it a lot better than I did an hour ago. So thank you. Uh, I'm grateful to all of you and a reminder that um, everybody who, who signed up for today's program will get a follow-up email with a little bit of information and a link to an action alert so that you can, can communicate with your lawmakers who, as Senator Brenner said, this is going to be coming out of committee in, in some fashion and we'll be, we'll be waiting the big birth announcement. Uh, but, but once it goes to the full legislature, your lawmakers will have an opportunity to, to vote in support. Uh, so, so please take a second to click through that action alert and, and send them a message and say, boy, we, we learned a lot today and uh, <laughs> we have some ideas for you. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I, I hope you'll also join us next week. Uh, next week's program is uh, Don't Texas Maine. What does that mean? There's been all sorts of upsetting news out of Texas lately, so it could be anything, but we're going to be talking about threats to our democracy. Um, we'll hear from Katie Naranjo, who is the chair of the Travis County, Texas Democratic Party. Her office was firebombed last September with a pretty uh, politically charged note attached to it. Uh, so she's going to tell us a little bit about what she's been through. And Will Hayward from the League of Women Voters of Maine will, uh, will join to share how this anti-democratic undercurrent may be beginning to bubble up in Maine and what we can do to make sure Maine doesn't end up like Texas. I hope to see you there. I'm grateful for all of you. And uh, have a terrific weekend. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Yeah, thank you. We would be, uh, I would be lost at sea without your support as a strong environmental legislator. So uh, your advocacy really means the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.